1 Peter chapter 3, we're just going to read a couple verses. I want to read, begin reading verse number 8. The Apostle Peter says, finally, that means ultimately, be ye of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Let's pray. Father, we do bless you. We're thankful to be in the house of God this morning. Amen. We're thankful, Lord, for the peace and assurance you placed in our hearts. Lord, we're glad that the grave could not hold you, that you rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. You conquered sin on the cross. Uh, and God, we're thankful because of that. The grave won't hold us because we put our faith and trust in you. Uh, and Lord, you washed our sins away. You forgave us of all sins. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that we've been robed in your righteousness. Uh, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, and God, we're thankful for the day that is about to come, the second coming of the Lord, uh, when you take your church out of here before you literally come back. Uh, and Lord, we're looking for that day. Uh, Lord, because you're alive, we'll live forevermore. We have eternal life. And God, we're certainly grateful for all those things. Thank you for a good Sunday school hour. Thank you, Lord, for the good singing. Thank you, Lord, for being a good God. Now, I pray you'd bless the reading of the Word of God. Lord, you know every heart in here this morning. You know our down-sitting and our uprising. You know our yesterdays, our todays, even our tomorrows. And God, you know what we are facing, what we have faced, and yet what we will face. And God, we know you being the God of all glory, know exactly what we stand in need of today. Now, Father, I pray for that one that may not be saved. I pray today would be the day of their salvation. I pray for those that are saved, but Lord, uh, the cares of this life, the pressures of this life, the stress of this life, uh, uh, or anything else about life is weighing them down. I pray today that they'd realize burdens are lifted at Calvary. And I pray that they'd realize there is help in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, I pray for not only Holy Ghost conviction, but I pray for Holy Ghost confirmation. I pray you'd help folks today. Edify your saints. Uh, Lord, draw us closer together. May we glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and may you truly be magnified in everything that's said and done. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll bless you for it, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. 1 Peter chapter number 3 could be called a chapter of long suffering. In verses 1 through 6 you find uh, the long suffering of wives who are saved but their husbands are not. And it teaches how they are to conduct themselves. We also find in verses 8 through 17 uh, the long suffering of the saint of God in our walk and how we are to endure some things, uh, and how we are to handle some things. Uh, but we are to be long-suffering. That means suffer long. That means uh, uh, just wait on the Lord and allow the Lord to have His perfect work, and patience have its perfect work, uh, and in due season we'll reap if we faint not. Uh, and the chapter concludes in verses 18 through 22, the long-suffering of the Word Himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what He endured uh, in order for you and I to be saved by the good grace of God. Uh, uh, listen, I, I uh, uh, love the Bible. The Bible is the best commentary you can ever have on the Bible. And uh, uh, you know me, there are certain things in the Bible I'm not going to let them go by without mentioning them to clarify some things because there are people uh, who have taken certain verses uh, and they have twisted them to fit their ideology and it does not line up with Scripture. Uh, and I hadn't planned on doing this. It's not in my notes, but it's here and I might as well do it, all right? Uh, 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 we find that uh, 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 it mentions how the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 18 hath once suffered for sins, uh, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, uh, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Let me stop right there. How many times did Jesus die on the cross? Once. If you could lose your salvation, he'd had to die on the cross a second time to be able to purchase you the second time. He did once for all. 
You need to know that because there are people teaching you lose your salvation. You can't lose it if it's in Christ. No? Uh, and I'm in his hand, and his hand's in the Father's hand. No man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. The Lord didn't give me substitutional life where it depends on things. He gave me eternal life. Mm -mm. So that clears that up. Mm -mm. But in verse number 19, it's very important you understand this. He says, but which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. I don't have time to get into this. This deals also in Ephesians chapter 4 where he went and led captivity captive. Say, what's he, what's he talking about? He went and he preached to those Old Testament saints. Uh, they had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ just like you and I. Uh, they were kept in a place called paradise. They could not go directly to heaven. Uh, but because of what Christ did on Calvary, uh, you and I that are saved to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. Uh, he also went and preached to those uh, who had rejected him just so they know why they're going to spend eternity in hell. Uh, but, uh, but he goes on to say in verse 20, this is important, which were sometimes disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Okay? It's very important. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Now, let me stop right there. There's a whole list of folks. We call them Campbellites because John Campbell developed their doctrine. There's one right up around the corner, not far from where Brother Adrian lives. They teach you cannot be saved unless you're baptized. Right. And they use that verse right there, baptism does save us. But they stop right there, by the way. Yep. And can I just say this? If baptism saves you, what do you do with the thief on the cross that trusted in Christ? But it goes on to say this, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but of the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, can I say that the figure of what happened in the ark also transpired on the cross? This is nowhere in my notes. It's killing my outline. But anyway. When Noah... And his family got in the ark. The ark was baptized in the wrath of Almighty God when he let it rain 40 days and 40 nights and he destroyed everything on the earth. They were saved because they were in the ark. The water didn't save them. The ark saved them. And what Jesus did on the cross is a picture of that. Jesus was baptized in the wrath of Almighty God. And if we're going to be saved, we've got to be saved in Jesus' baptism. Jesus bled and died and suffered for your sin and my sin. As a matter of fact, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our salvation is in Christ. He is our ark. Those in Christ are saved. All water baptism really does is give us a good conscience towards God that we've taken the first step in obedience to the Christian life. Amen. We're not saved by the water. We're saved by the wrath that Jesus took for you and I Amen. when he became our Savior. Good. I hope that helps you. But it's not in my notes. I'm just glad I'm saved. Amen. I'm glad I know the book, a little bit of it anyway. And I'm glad I'm not dependent on water baptism. Amen. If you're not saved and you get baptized, all you are is a wet sinner. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad I got saved. And I'm glad I've been baptized into the Lord's church. And I'm thankful for the church. But what I really want to focus on is verse number 8. Finally, again, ultimately, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. And can I say, in this verse, we find... Mm, the believer's attitude. He tells us that our attitudes ought to be of one mind. Be all of one mind. It means we ought to have the same goal. Seek the same direction. Seek to believe in the same Lord. The same doctrines. The same truths. We ought to have that mind. We ought to not have an argumentative mind. We ought to not have a divided mind. We ought to not have a mind that 
questions everything God's already said. Amen. We ought to have a mind that is equal, one mind, one accord. Paul wrote to every epistle, to, uh, to every church to be of the same mind, to be like-minded, be of one accord. Here Peter's writing the same thing, that we're to be of one mind. Can I say that's an attitude? Yeah. Now I can come in and say, I'm not going to have a good attitude. I'm not going to be like-minded. Yeah. I'm going to hurt the service. Sure. Yes, sir. Or I'm going to have the good attitude, the right attitude. We need to have an attitude of one mind. It also says in that verse we're to be pitiful. Now some of you look pitiful, but it's not meaning the same thing as the Bible term. Amen. Looking, uh, being pitiful don't mean walking around with on your lower lip. Right. Right. I'm so pitiful. <laughs> yes, you are. But you're not Bible pitiful. Right. Amen. That word pitiful there means worthy of compassion. Now let me just say this, in the household of faith, we know the Bible teaches some things. Can I say the Bible teaches that a man that doesn't work shouldn't eat? The Bible teaches that a man that don't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. So the Bible teaches that we're not to be spiritual hobos. And I preached on that one time. Can I say the Bible also teaches that there are some things we're to abstain from, all appearance of evil. Mm, that means if it looks like the world, smells like the world, acts like the world, we need to run from it. The Bible also teaches that the child of God is to give of the first fruits of the increase that God has blessed him with. The Bible also teaches that we're to extend to one another the right hand of fellowship. Amen. The Bible also teaches that we're to be in good standing when we come to the house of God. We've got to do all week long, live as close to the Bible as we can, and if we step in a mud puddle, we're to go to 1 John 1, 9, get it cleaned up, so when we come in the house of God, there's no hindrance between us and God, or us and one another. We're all responsible of that. To be worthy of compassion means that you're toting the rope. You're pulling your end of the bargain. Yeah. Brother Ray, if you're not tithing, if you're not providing for Miss Pam, if you come in in a bad attitude and you've lived like the devil all week long, you're not worthy of compassion because you're not holding the standard. Boy, that really flew in the fi face of everybody, didn't it? You hadn't heard that, had you? Being pitiful means that you're worthy of compassion. That you've done the best your ability, your job as a member of this local assembly. So when you come in, you come in in one mind, and you're worthy of compassion. Compassion of the brethren and compassion from the Lord. Hmm? Be pitiful. Hmm? Didn't say look pitiful. Said be pitiful. All right. This is an attitude. Can I say... We're also to not only have the believer's attitude in verse number 8, we find the believer's actions in verse number 8. Look what it says. It says, having compassion one of another. If somebody's worthy of compassion, we're to have compassion on them. Can I say the Bible even teaches outside the realm, if somebody comes in and they've messed up and they seek compassion, we're to show them compassion. Amen. Hmm? Huh? We're to never, ever put, put ourselves on a pedestal thinking we're better than somebody else. But if somebody needs to get to Jesus, we need to get them to Jesus. And can I say, uh, regardless of where they've messed up, we're still to show them compassion if they're seeking it. Can I say this? It also says we're to have an action of love. Love is brethren. I forgot what I'm about ready to say, but it just came to mind. I once knew a man who got saved out of a motorcycle gang. And this won't mean much to a lot of you, but it will to this guy. He'll know. There used to be a gang in the late 60s and early 70s that ran these parts called the Iron Horsemen. 
That was the Midwest version of the Hell's Angels. And the Iron Horseman did a lot of bad things, things I can't say in mixed company. This man was saved as a member of the Iron Horseman. And he left the Iron Horseman. There's a problem, Brother Josh, you didn't leave the Iron Horseman because you knew where the bodies were buried. So if you went to leave them, there was a hit put on you. For two years, there was a hit on this man before he finally went and he met with them and told them he wasn't revealing their secret, secrets. He said he just found religion. He found Jesus. They understood that talk. So they took the hit off of him. But this is what the man told me after being in church for a few years. He said, I see things in the church that is far worse than what I saw in the Iron Horseman. He said, there are people that bicker and fight in the church. There are people that hold things against people in the church. He said, when I was with the Iron Horseman, we had all things common. He said, if your motorcycle broke down, they gave you a motorcycle. He said, if uh, you were hungry, they gave you food. If you needed money, they gave you money. If you needed a weapon, you, they gave you a weapon. You needed anything else, you had it. Uh, they had all things common in the most wicked thing we can think of. The church, where to love his brethren. The Bible lets us know in Ephesians 6 that our enemy is not flesh and blood. We're not to have quarrel one with another. And this is nowhere in my notes, but it, it, it's helping me. I hope it's helping you. We're to love one another. We're to care for one another. We're to be there for one another. We're to link up arm in arm one with another. Uh, hey, this is a community that the world ought to envy. But he also deals that we're to be courteous. Look what it says, verse number 8. Be courteous. Hmm? What's wrong with being courteous? Right. Now, I know the world don't know anything about being courteous. Right. What's wrong with op opening the door for somebody? Right. What's, op what's wrong with saying, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am? What's wrong with saying, please and thank you? Yeah. What's wrong with, uh, is there anything I can do for you today? What's wrong with... Uh, being a little uh, Chick-fil-A, uh, my pleasure. What's wrong with that? Amen. We should be courteous in the house of God. I'll be courteous. You don't know what people's went through this week. You don't know how much the devil's been on their back. You don't know what they've been through on the job or what they've been through at the house or what they've been through uh, even driving to church. Uh, hey, when they come to the house of God, they ought to see somebody that's glad to see them, uh, somebody that's courteous, uh, somebody that takes some initiative and shows them some kindness. Huh? I know I'm preaching to a choir. we got a great church. But I'm going somewhere. Hang in there. Say, so I don't enjoy this preacher. Well, I am, so leave me alone. But in verse number 9, we find the believers answering. He says, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. Can I say, as believers, we're not to accuse and rail on one another and rake one another over the coals uh, and treat one another evilly, but yet it happens in churches all the time. Uh, hey, instead of rendering evil for evil, we're to bless them. And I'm not talking about blessing them out, Clint. Some of you will get that. Uh, I have found over the years there are people that accuse or people that rail or people that uh, 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 rake me over the coals for this or that or what not. Uh, and I have found for over the years, Brother Donald, the Holy Ghost is so good uh, uh, while they're doing it. The Lord just allows me to sit there and take it. Uh, and uh, 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 he even allows me, Christian, a lot of times not to hear it because you know what I, when I hear things I don't like how I act. Uh, but the Lord just kind of sits down on me and helps me in those things. Uh, and I was reading this this week and I I thought, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you. I haven't opened up my big mouth uh, when I shouldn't open it up. Thank you, Lord. I haven't put both feet in my mouth when I probably would have. Uh, thank you, Lord, uh, uh, for letting me take it uh, and even tell folks I love them when they've uh, not loved me. Uh, even tell folks it's okay when it's not been okay. Uh, what a blessing. That's how we're to answer, folks. Uh, Amen. Yep. Thad and Miss Tammy are on vacation. Oh, I think she's working. He's vacationing. 
They're suffering in Hawaii. Years and years ago, I'll pick on them. They wouldn't care if I was here. I'd say it anyway. Years and years and years ago, there was somebody going around the country telling lies about me. Bad lies. Said I steal money out of a church. Said I didn't believe the King James Bible was the Word of God. We got it in the carpet, man. It's on the wall. It's on the pulpit. It's on the communion table. Said all kinds of, didn't believe in the local church, all kinds of heinous things. Well, this same fellow went to, to a church and called me my name from behind the pulpit and said those very things. The only problem was, is Tammy and Thad had dear friends sitting in the congregation. They found out, Brother Clint. They pulled up in my driveway. Tammy's got a 38 locked and loaded. She says, Preacher, where's that guy live? I'm going to go take care of business. <laughs> now, as much as my flesh enjoyed that, sure. the truth be told, what I told them is what I would tell them today. Let God be true and every man a liar. Right. God can handle all that stuff. And by the way, I've always had the, the opinion if they're, if, they're, if they're accusing me, they're leaving somebody else alone. Hmm? You say, what happened? Well, I'm still preaching. Unfortunately, that guy's not. God has a way of equaling everything. Just let God take care of all that. We're supposed to control what we can control. Uh, but uh, don't get ugly. Ugly never helps anybody but the world's cause. Uh, what I'm interested in this morning, I'm interested there in verse number 8, where he says, love as brethren. With God's help, I want to preach to love as brethren. Now, in my study, the word love in some form is mentioned some 442 times in the Bible. And as much as I'd like to read every one of them verses, I sure would like you to be able to eat sometime today, okay? But uh, many times when the word love is mentioned, it is addressing our love towards God or God's love towards man. For example, in Deuteronomy 6, 5, the Bible says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Jesus said that was the first and greatest commandment, uh, that we love God with all our mind, all our heart, all our soul. Uh, we ought to be totally in love with God. Uh, the Bible said in Jeremiah 31, 3, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Uh, uh, we find God is, there's never been a time when God didn't love us, uh, and we ought to love him. Uh, but can I say, uh, as much as the Bible says about God loving us, John 3, 16, 1 John 4, 19, we go on and on and on. As much as the Bible teaches us we ought to love God, uh, uh, the Bible's also very clear uh, on we uh, are to love the brethren. Uh, and can I say, uh, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of verses that back that up. But let me just give you a few. Uh, John 13, 35 says, By this, uh, by what? Us loving one another. Uh, uh, Shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. Uh, John 15, 17, These things I command you, uh, that ye love one another. Uh, Romans 12, 10, Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor, prefer one another. Uh, Ephesians 4 2, with all lowliness and meekness, uh, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Uh, that means even when you can't stand one another, just put up with one another in love. Uh, hey, uh, 1 John 3 10 and 11 says, In this children of God, uh, the children of God are manifest, uh, and the children of the devil. Uh, Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, uh, neither he that loveth not his brother. Uh, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Uh, verse 14 of 1 John 3, uh, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Uh, he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Uh, 1 John 4, 7, uh, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Uh, and everyone that 
that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Uh, he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Uh, and this was manifested, the love of God toward us, uh, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world uh, that we might live through Him. Uh, herein is love, not that we love God, uh, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Uh, beloved, uh, uh, if God so loved us, uh, we ought also to love one another. Uh, and oh, we find throughout the Bible we're exhorted to love one another. Well, why should we love the brethren? Well, first of all, can I say, love brings unity. Amen. Look again at verse number 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind. We'll never have unity if we don't love one another. Mm -mm. Can I say, the psalmist said in Psalms 133, 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We ought to be for each other. We ought to be for the Lord. And can I say, true unity only comes when our love's right. We ought to love the brethren for unity's sake. Without unity, we can never have revival. Without unity, the Spirit of God is being grieved somewhere in the church. We need to have unity, and that comes when we love right. We ought to love because love brings unity. Can I say this? Love brings understanding. Look again at verse number 8, where it says, uh, Having compassion one of another. Can I say, when you love right, you have understanding for somebody. You show them compassion, not judgment. Hmm? Uh, when you love somebody, you don't judge their situation. You have compassion on them in their situation. Now, again, it's good to have Seth and Bailey here, home from school. Glad you got to see me, Seth. If you want to be a recipient of compassion, you've got to be pitiful. You've got to be worthy of it. If people have shown you compassion and you continue to take advantage of that, there'll come a point they'll stop showing you compassion. Hmm? Uh, listen, there have been times when we have what we call poundings, food drives, around Christmas time, around the holidays, you know, we don't want to see anybody go without, and we'll, we'll have a pounding, have food, and we'll get food galore. We've had canned goods and hams and turkeys and all that, and uh, uh, we pray about try to find out... Uh, who may really have a need for in the church, and we'll, we'll try to meet that need. But I have found, Miss Pam, there's some people take advantage of that compassion. Because the next year, they're, they're haunting around, waiting to see if they're going to be a recipient again. It amazes me, Brother Donald, there are people that won't be faithful to God until it's holiday time. Can I say... If you want to be a recipient of compassion, show compassion, but also be worthy of compassion. Mm -mm. And I say it is never, ever, ever, ever a burden to help the faithful ones. But it seems like the ones you help the most, number one, truly aren't faithful, and number two, they're the quickest to turn their back on you. They'll find out there's a church down the street giving more ham away than you're giving, and they'll line up down there. Well, can I say, love brings understanding, though. I know in pastoring this church for 24 years, I cannot think of a time when somebody stood up broken and was transparent that this church didn't rally around them. You know why? Because we love one another. Love brings understanding. It brings unity. Can I say, love brings uplifting. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 16, From whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying itself in love. Now that verse is loaded. What that means is the body is made up of a bunch of parts. Can I say, where would you be without your hand today? Where would you be if your kneecap's out of joint? Ask Brother Ed. You'd be on a walker. huh? If your whole body's not working properly, you got problems. Amen. And can I say the body of Christ needs to be working properly 
We're fitly joined together. God's the one that put us all together. He's the one that sent us all here. Uh, and we edify this thing uh, by love. What does that mean? We build it up. And we're to be uplifting. Can I say it's easy to tear people down. It takes a real child of God to be uplifting. You know, there are some people you just like being around, make you feel better. There are some people you avoid like the, like the COVID. Huh? Huh? We used to have some people, I dared ask them how they was doing. By the time they got te telling me what all was wrong with them, I, did, I just felt like going out, outside and laying down and die, you know? <laughs> there wasn't nothing uplifting in that. That's why I made the rule, you don't talk to me about anything serious before I get up to preach, huh? But we ought to be uplifting. We ought to encourage people. We ought to smile. We ought to do something. Because you know what? We all face the same big bad world. And some people are facing it a whole lot harder than you and I. And some of them are really up against it. The devil's camped on their doorstep. Uh, and uh, they're really facing some hardship and some heartaches. Uh, uh, some of them have really uh, 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 lost a loved one. Or they've uh, lost a job. Or they've uh, been talked about like a dog. And when they come to the house of God, uh, they ought to be uplifted. Uh, somebody ought to uh, get up underneath them and help bear their burden. And just be good to them. And speak good to them. Uh, encourage them. Uh, pray with them. Uh, let them know you care. Uh, there's nothing like having somebody that lets you know they care about you when you're down. Uh, and love will do that. If you love somebody, you'll uplift them. Hmm? Can I say this? Love brings unction. Unction's a very interesting word. You find it over there in 1 John chapter number 2. It said, ye have an unction from the Holy One. Uh, Lord lets me, I might even preach along those lines a little bit tonight, but let me say this about unction. Unction, the best way I understand it, is power from God and the presence of God. Without His power, we couldn't even get out of bed today. We certainly couldn't truly worship Him in spirit and truth unless He takes part. And sometimes He manifests His presence and just lets you know He's there. That ought to be a normal thing at the house of God, and that happens when our love is right, because love brings unction. You remember what I said a minute ago about unity? Where there is no unity, there will never be unction. The reason there's not great revival in America today is our churches have love problems. Too many people are worried about who's going to get the credit for the revival. Too many people are more worried about why somebody's not there, why somebody's doing this, or why somebody's doing it, and, and our love's not right. If we love right, we'll have unity. And if we love right, we'll have unction. And unction will solve all the problems. Say, you say, what does unction do? You ever read Acts chapter 2? They thought Peter was drunk. No, he just had a good taste of unction. Amen. Uh, he had Holy Ghost boldness and preach like nobody ever heard preach. And that day, 3,000 souls were added to the church. Hmm? What a blessing. Unction does what we cannot do. The only way we'll have unction is have the right love. We've got to have love for the brethren, love for God, love for the things of God. And look out, we get to loving right. We're liable to have some unction. And then let me say this. Love brings undeniable outcomes. Now, if you still got your place in, in 1 Peter 3, look over in chapter number 4, verse number 8. It says, And above all things have fervent, that means fiery, charity. Another word for charity in our language is love. It says, And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You know what that means, Brother Rod? That means if I love you right, my love's stronger than any of your failures. I'll never forget, we was in the old building. I preached one time on the balm of Gilead and typed it as a picture of love. I mentioned an individual that had been close to me. That individual made some poor choices, but I said my love for that individual far outweighs those poor choices. Can I say? We got the right kind of love. 
We won't gloat in people's failures. We'll hurt because of their failures. And we'll try our best to love them back to Jesus. Amen. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one a spirit of meekness, lest thyself also be tempted. Amen. Galatians had a little bit to say about that. And can I say, love brings undeniable outcomes. When you show the right kind of love, it may, it may impact somebody so much that they start impacting others, and they may start impacting others. You know what is contagious? Love. Do you know what the political arena has tried to push the last four years? Hate. Yeah. Hate brings division. Love brings unity. It's amazing. Brother Adrian and I was the only few white people that was in a building with about, I don't know, 350, 400 people in it, and you'd have never known there was any color in that building because we were there to worship the Lord. And people treated me just like they treated him. Why? It was, there's never a color problem when love's involved. Never a race problem when love's involved. Huh? Can I say you'll love the most filthy, vilest sinner when your love's right? And no telling how that'll impact them. I've learned this. Love draws people a whole lot quicker than fear does. Fear will cause you to control people. Love will cause you to comfort people. God help us to love right. I'm going to give you a story I heard this week. Somebody sent me this story. It was hard for me to get through it. And even putting the highlights together on my outline, I still found myself choking up. I hope to be able to hold my emotions The story is about a fifth grade teacher named Mrs. Thompson. And Mrs. Thompson addressed her class like she did every year, this particular year, but she started this year with a lie. She told the students that she loved them all the same. But there sat a fellow named Teddy Stoddard. She had observed him in times gone by and noticed he didn't play well with others notice that he could be a rascal notice that his clothes were often dirty and needed to be washed and he most of the time smelled like he needed a bath and when she made the statement she loved them all the same she really didn't mean it because she didn't love Teddy Stoddard the way she loved some of the others and as classes began taking place she found herself sing singling him out in the class, and she took much delight in writing big, large Fs on his paper in red ink so everybody could see it. Then Mrs. Thompson had to do what every teacher had to do. She had to go and review the file of all of her students. And in that, she would find what previous teachers had to say about the students. She deliberately left Teddy for last. Upon going through his file, the first, greeter, first grade teacher wrote, Teddy is a pleasant and wonderful student. He gets along great with others. He's always eager to learn and usually is the first one with the right answers. Second grade teacher wrote that he was a delight and she saw great potential in him until his mother was diagnosed with cancer. Then he struggled to keep up. The third grade teacher wrote that his mother had died and that his father wasn't very supportive at all and that Teddy grew very distant. His fourth grade teacher said that he was withdrawn and often fell asleep in class. Miss Thompson felt ashamed of her own actions. And she determined to make Teddy a priority. She started showing him some attention. She included him in the class and she praised him when he did good. Christmas time came and all the kids brought a gift to the teacher. Most of them were wrapped real pretty. Teddy's came and it was wrapped in a brown paper bag, and the children snickered at him. 
When she opened Teddy's gift, she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a half a bottle of perfume. The other cr children just laughed at him. She was quick to put the bracelet on and she sprayed the perfume on her wrist, made a big deal of the gift that Teddy gave. When class was over, he came up and hugged her and said, you smell just like my mama. As the year continued, she engaged and encouraged Teddy. By the year's end, he became one of the top students. And at the end of the school year, she found a note underneath her desk, or underneath her door, saying, you're my favorite teacher and the best teacher I've ever had. When he graduated middle school, she once again found a note under her door from Teddy. He said, you're still my favorite teacher. A few years went by, she didn't hear anything of Teddy. But upon graduating high school, he finished third in his class. And again, he left her a note. He told her, you're still my favorite teacher. A few, years, a few more years go by and she got a letter in the mail from Teddy. Said it was a struggle, but he graduated college with the highest of honors. But she was still his favorite teacher. A few more years go by. He gets another letter in the mail. Not only did it still say that she was still his favorite teacher, but it was signed different this time. It was signed Theodore F. Stoddard, M.D. Two more years go by, and she got a phone call from Teddy. Said he's getting married. Wanted to know if she'd come to the wedding and if she would sit where, where, the, where it's usually reserved for the mother to sit. Because by this time his father had passed away too. Miss Thompson gladly and honorably accepted. When she arrived at the wedding, she wore that same bracelet, missing a few stones, wore that same perfume. After the ceremony, Teddy hugged her. He said, Thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Said, you have been the greatest teacher I ever had. Mrs. Thompson whispered in his ear. She was fighting tears back and said, Teddy, you've got it all wrong. You're the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I did not know how to teach until I met you. When we show some love, to those, even if they're undeserving. We have no idea the consequences that will happen by just showing people we care about them. <clears throat> How many little teddies are out there hurt, not even understanding the hand that's been dealt them in life, and all they need is somebody to show some initiative. Somebody just love on them a little bit. Somebody to look beyond where they are, their status, their faults, and see them as Christ does. To love his brethren doesn't mean just love the people in the suits and nice dresses. It means to love as Christ. I wonder today...
when it's all said and done, how many of us are going to have somebody come up like Teddy and said, you made a difference in my life? Or maybe, my dear friends, somebody's made a difference in your life. Why don't you pay it forward and make a difference in somebody else's life? We'd all be in a mess had the Lord not sent somebody by our way to be good to us. I wonder this morning, will we, will we take inventory and ask how our love is? Well, I don't want to have a divided spirit. I don't want to have an unkind spirit. I don't want to have an unforgiving spirit. I want to have a spirit that's soaked in love. Regardless of whether anybody deserves it or not, because I sure didn't deserve God's love. Can we choose to have the right mindset and have the right ac actions and the right answer? It's always about love. How's your love this morning? How's your compassion this morning? How's your standing with Christ this morning? This morning, maybe you need to come and thank God for His love. Maybe you need to come and tell Him you love Him. Maybe He's put somebody in your life that's here this morning that's made a difference. You need to go and tell them you love them. Maybe there's somebody you've not been kind to and the Lord said, you need to get that right. Go make it right and get, and get your love right. Maybe God spoke to you about a totally different thing than anything I've even said. Today, the Lord's here. Let's do business with the Lord. Let's all stand this morning. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While he comes, let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. Why you love us, I do not know. But I'm sure glad you do. Yes. Now, Lord, I pray you take our feeble efforts. You'd speak to hearts this morning. Help us to do an inventory about our love. Then, God, I pray you'd speak to hearts. I pray if there's anybody that's a stranger to the grace and love of God that today would be the day they put their faith and trust in Christ. Lord, I pray for somebody here today that, Lord, needs to do business with God, they would. I pray if there's anything else you're speaking to people's hearts about, they'd just step out and do what you told them to do. But I pray that you'd be honored and glorified, that, Lord, we truly love his brethren, and, God, you'd get glory from that. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.